Hello, everyone, and welcome to Litigation Radio. I'm your host, Dave Scriven Young. I'm a commercial and environmental litigator in the Chicago office of Bakar and Abramson, which is recognized as the largest law firm serving the construction industry, with 150 lawyers and 11 offices around the U.S. On this show, we talk to the country's top litigators and judges to discover best practices in developing our careers, winning cases, getting more clients, and building a sustainable practice. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcasting app to make sure you're getting updated with future episodes. This podcast is brought to you by the litigation section of the American Bar Association. It's where I make my home in the ABA. The litigation section provides litigators of all practice areas the resources we need to be successful advocates for our clients. Learn more at ambar.org slash litigation. The Supreme Court has been thrust into the spotlight recently with its decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, the case that overturned the court's abortion precedents, including Roe versus Wade. Although SCOTUS gets most of the press, the courts of appeals hear many more cases. In 2021, for example, almost 44,000 new appeals were filed in the U.S. Courts of Appeals. And by contrast, the Supreme Court agrees to hear only about 100 to 150 of the more than 7,000 cases that is asked to review each year. As litigators in the trial courts, we need to be aware of the strategies that may be employed by our appellate friends and what we can do as trial lawyers to enhance our clients' chances on appeal. To discuss these issues, I'm happy to welcome back Lawrence Rosenberg to the show. Larry is a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Jones Day and was a guest with his wife, Deborah, on the show back on episode six, which discussed how to deal with stress in the legal profession. Larry has tried cases and argued appeals throughout the country and has been lead counsel in numerous matters in the U.S. Supreme Court. He has considerable experience in several substantive areas of the law, and he has litigated cases involving several federal agencies. Larry received his B.A. from Cornell and his J.D. from the University of Pennsylvania. Thanks for coming back on the show, Larry. Thank you, Dave. Well, I'd love to get kind of some of your background. How did you get into appellate law? I think a lot of you know law students and, and lawyers are interested. I mean, they know all about tr- getting into you know trial work. How does how do you get to be a specialist, if you will, in appellate law? Dave, I was always pretty interested in appellate law. Right after law school, I clerked for a judge, Jane Roth, on the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, and that was a really good introduction to appellate law. And then from there, I went to the U.S. Department of Justice and worked in the federal programs branch of the Civil Division, where I handled a lot of trial work, but also got to argue several appeals. And that really got me interested in in doing appellate work. And I was fortunate that when I left the Justice Department and went to Jones Day, I was able to join their appellate practice. And I've done probably about 50 to 60 percent of my practice over the years in appellate and Supreme Court work and then the rest in trial court work. So what I would recommend to people out there is, you know, do everything you can to get involved in appellate work. I think clerking is a wonderful thing to do, even if if you don't get or, or aren't interested in a federal court appellate clerkship. There are a number of wonderful state court appellate clerkships out there, uh, and that would be a great place to start as well. And certainly I'd recommend folks go back to our uh, previous episode uh, concerning law clerks. Really great episode. We had a federal judge and a clerk that came on to discuss kind of that process. So really encourage folks to listen to that. Larry, I think a lot of people um, are really interested in the U.S. Supreme Court itself and how you know somebody might become kind of a lead counsel on those cases. Is it is it a gradual development of your practice going from, um, you know, state appellate work or a federal appellate work to the Supreme Court? Or is it something that people just kind of jump into? So I, I think it's it's definitely a progression and it sort of depends on on the case. There are a number of firms in Washington, for example, that have pretty well established Supreme Court practices. And in order to sort of, you know, work in those practices you would start out trying to do appellate work. If you could get into that firm's appellate practice, if you show some ability for it, um, that would be wonderful. And then you would go through, you know, working on appellate cases, arguing cases in the courts of appeals, and and potentially graduate your way up uh, to Supreme Court work. And, and that's how I started and worked on a number of Supreme Court matters for my firm's more experienced Supreme Court lawyers before I, I sort of had the opportunity to step into a lead role. And I've also heard, I think there's a guy at Jenner, I saw an article uh, where he actually 
develops a Supreme Court practice through doing pro bono work. I assume that's uh, an avenue that's available as well. It, it, it is. And again, it depends on how that coordinates with whatever firm or, or agency you're in. But that definitely is. And, and honestly, for a young lawyer, perhaps the best way to get appellate argument experience is through pro bono work. At our firm, we try to get the people in our appellate practice and a number of other lawyers and other practices argument experience by doing pro bono appeals in the federal courts of appeals. And then again, um, Supreme Court opportunities tend to come up in pro bono cases more regularly in, in many ways than in paying cases, because in the paying cases, you're usually dealing with very high stakes matters for a particular client. And it's unlikely that the client's going to want to have the argument done by somebody doing their first argument. But in the pro bono cases, you often can get that experience. And so that's a great way to start. That, that makes a lot of sense. So take us behind the scenes of the Supreme Court. We'd love to hear kind of like what it's like to argue a case uh, before uh, the nine justices of the Supreme Court. The one thing I would say at the outset is perhaps the most important thing to having a positive oral argument is extensive preparation. When I argue a case in the courts of appeals, I prepare a pretty good amount. I do a couple of moot courts typically to prepare for those arguments. But for the U.S. Supreme Court, I do several moot courts, sometimes as many as six moot courts before a, a variety of different moot, moot court panels. And I found that that can be really, really helpful in, in anticipating the questions you're going to get. And it's really critical to do that. It's critical for you, for your colleagues, for people you talk to, to think of questions you're likely to get, to sketch those questions out and prepare answers to those questions. Now, the Supreme Court now has a new format, which it didn't have until a couple of years ago, where they give the lawyers two minutes to sort of do an introduction without questions. And then they open it up to questions, and the questions are typically done in the order of, of seniority on the court. So that makes it a little easier uh, than before when it was a bit of a free-for-all where you would get questions from you know several justices potentially at once, and you'd have to sort through those questions and try to answer them as best you can. Now, you can really focus on the question you get and try to answer it. And so that's a critical skill to have, uh, again, to have prepared for the questions, to have sketched out answers. Now, you're not going to get two minutes or three minutes to answer a question. You've really got to try to answer it in 20 or 30 seconds. But coming up with that 20 or 30 second nugget in answer to those questions is really critical. And what other kind of formalities or, I don't know, fun things, I guess, uh, that you do during Supreme Court arguments or, or beforehand, I assume there's a lot of security and I don't know, as a, a trial lawyer who's never been, I mean, I've been on tw a tour of the Supreme Court, but I have never practiced there. I assume there's pomp and circumstance and, and things of that nature, or I may be completely wrong. It's just kind of like you're going to a different building to, to do an argument, but you're just preparing more. Are, are there, you know, uh, any other differences that uh, might be fun for our listeners to hear about? Well, well, sure. Um, you know, it's kind of a, an interesting thing. I haven't argued a case since the court reopened officially uh, after the pandemic. And some of this has changed a little bit because as of right now, there are no general spectators at the court. You know, when I argued previously, there, there were spectators. And so you would arrive at the court in the morning. There is a lawyer's lounge and, and the arguing counsel would check in there. And then they would go through security and be led into the courtroom. And if you were arguing first, you would, you would be led up to counsel table. And then you would would prepare from there. The the parties who are arguing the second case, there's there are big tables behind the main counsel table, and that's where you sit if you're waiting to argue the second case. One thing that's very interesting that I don't know that everybody knows about is that when you argue a case at the court or even just sit at counsel table, you get a quill, <laughs> a, a a quill uh, to to keep and take home. Um, I, I don't actually think they have ink up there for the quill to be used, although there, there may be uh, ink there if you ask for it. But you do get your quill, and so you have your, your quill, and if you've sat at council table a number of times, you can uh, start a little collection of your quills. And so I, I, I have on my desk a, a little container that has a few quills in it. But um, 
it is a very nice parting gift and and uh, it's important to remember to take them. I had an argument a few years back and my co-counsel, uh, it was her first time sitting at council table and she actually forgot her quill, but was fortunate enough to be able to go back after the, the next argument had concluded and retrieve it. Oh gosh, that's funny. Well, well, great. And and you've mentioned changes. Obviously, you know, COVID has had a big change on the court, you know, starting with telephonic, I guess, arguments. But now we've seen a substantial change to the composition of the Supreme Court, a new 6-3 major- conservative majority as a result of appointments made by President Trump. We've seen the first black woman on the court ever. And the first time we've had four women on the court. So, do any of those factors change the way that you approach briefing or oral arguments before the Supreme Court? So the answer is to some extent, yes. I mean, in every case, what you're trying to do is figure out how to convince a majority of the justices to rule in your client's favor. And depending on the composition of the court, that calculus may change. Certainly with the the changes we've seen recently, there may be some additional considerations in certain cases. I mean, you previewed this by mentioning Dobbs, and I think one of the things that the most recent term and and really the most recent few terms have led to is a consideration that precedent may not be as binding as some people once thought it was. And so if you have a strong argument to overrule precedent or perhaps set it aside in some way, those are arguments you want to consider advancing. Whereas, you know, years before, it it was generally a last resort to ask the court to overturn precedent. Now, I think it's it's a little more commonplace. And depending on the case, you may have better luck getting the court to consider overturning or at least reconsidering precedent. And so that's something that's changed a little bit. I, I think, as always, you have to be extremely respectful of the justices. And, you know, that that means Number one, not calling justices by an incorrect name, which has happened (laughs) to people over the years, and and just being very respectful. And if there are little quirks that a justice may have, you have to respect them. Some of the justices uh, have been known to ask fairly long questions at times. And so you have to be very patient and not interrupt the justice uh, if the question is going. And, And some of the justices over the years sometimes have taken pauses in their questions. And so again, you have to be respectful of that. But but the, the, the key point really for Supreme Court argument is to carefully consider what the answers to the questions would be. And when you get asked those questions, give those most compelling, direct and concise answers. That's a great tip. And you did mention Dobbs. You know, as I was reading uh, the opinion, I noticed, you know, obviously Justice Thomas's concurring decisions uh, stating that the court should reconsider other decisions of the court. Um, And a lot have been a lot has been made in the press about his concurring decision and kind of whether it could be uh, used in the future to strike down or overturn other decisions. Um, do you see that as being a, a, a kind of a guidepost to where the, the court may be going? Or is it certainly, you know, just one um, opinion of a justice? You know, of course, something that we should respect, but um, something that does not inform what we think the, where, where the court is going. I think it's hard to tell for sure, but I think most people who follow the court have taken that concurrence fairly seriously and are thinking that there may be other cases out there that the court may revisit. And and I alluded to that a little bit before. I think if you have a case where there's a precedent, particularly a more recent precedent, but, you know, seeing seeing what happened in Dobbs may be an older precedent, and you think the court really should revisit it, I think it's certainly now fair game to make those arguments. What the court will actually do, we don't know. Uh, it's hard to say whether there are are other justices or you know five other or four other justices to get a five ju- justice majority who might be interested in overturning other cases. But I think people are taking it seriously, and I, I think Congress is taking it seriously. You can see now the effort to pass federal law protecting same sex marriage, with some concern that the Supreme Court's decisions in that area might be revisited. 
Got it. And so let's let's switch gears a little bit, get away from the Supreme Court and talk about kind of uh, the practical tips that we might give to trial lawyers and, and litigators, uh, because we're always, you know, looking towards, you know, our verdict, whether it's a, coming from the jury or, or, or from the judge. But then, then we're looking uh, towards the appeals and always trial lawyers are, are thinking about what can we do to help our future appellate colleagues uh, who may take the, uh, this case on appeal. Um, so do you have any tips for litigators who can make sure that um, our appellate friends uh, can have an easier job as you go through that process? I think the most important tip is to preserve the record. I think it's critical that in a trial court, if there's an issue that could conceivably be appealed, to make sure that you preserve the record, that you preserve it by making the appropriate objection or the appropriate argument in the trial court uh, so that when it goes up on appeal, that argument is available. I think secondly, something that I really do recommend where possible is to have appellate counsel involved in the trial court uh, to make sure that, that any issues or arguments that might be the basis of an appeal aren't just preserved, but are actually presented to the court fully so that you have a, a good record so that you can you know, use the trial court discussion of the issue as a springboard for the appeal. One of the things my, my firm does is that when we have a large trial particularly, we have one or more lawyers from our appellate practice uh, serve as part of the trial team. And they will often do things like draft the main motions or draft a summary judgment motion so that the arguments that are likely to come up on appeal are fully presented to the trial court. Uh, and they work with the lead counsel to make sure that other things like objections are made and, and other points that might need to be preserved are preserved uh, as fully as possible. And so I think both of those things can be very beneficial to make sure that the case is best postured for appeal. So you mentioned preserving the record, and and obviously it goes beyond just kind of like having a, a, a transcript um, uh, of the trial, which you know sometimes you don't have. And like in Cook County, for example, you know where I practice most of the time, uh, we don't have a court mandated you know court reporter process. So we actually have to make sure that we get one in there to take the record of the trial. But Speaking of ob objections and, and motion practice and that sort of thing, what are some tips in making sure that um, you have that, um, you, you make those objections and you have appropriate motions? Is it uh, best to have things um, in paper or to make sure that you have the le legal arguments set forth? Because I, I see in a lot of opinions uh, where courts say, well, you didn't raise this in the trial court, so therefore you can't raise in the appellate court. That seems to be the biggest problem here. Yeah, I think it's, again, two things. I think it's preparation. And so, for example, if if there's an issue that you're concerned about, for example, if there's been a motion in limine that you filed and the motion was denied, making sure that when that issue comes up, you object. And so you could have notes, you could have a cheat sheet. Uh, I mean, one thing that you can do, even apart from the written motions, is to maybe have a page of notes where you know that when an issue comes up, you make an objection and just a reminder to make sure to object to that when it comes up during the trial. But as you suggested, Dave, I think a lot of the time it's very, very helpful to have made formal motions on those issues, whether it's a motion to eliminate before trial, whether it's some kind of motion during trial uh, and actually have, uh, even if it's a short one or two page motion written out that you can hand up to the bench. That can be very helpful. And then certainly, as the trial progresses, making sure that any, any problem is directly addressed. Very few judges, in my experience, will get all that upset with you if you just interrupt for a minute to, to object to preserve an issue or ask the court if it could you know, take a break or take a pause for a minute to consider a very short motion that you hand up to the bench. There are some judges who may get upset, but most of them won't. And it's really important to do that to preserve your issues. So I, I, to me, for the trials that I've done, it seems like 
we want to make there's a balance right between objecting too much and not letting thing too many things go and i think what some lawyers use um you know are standing objections where you have an issue like you mentioned uh, a motion in in limine where um you have an issue that that comes up during the trial and there may be you know five or six questions that opposing counsel is is making on direct um, your motion eliminate was to exclude that evidence, and some lawyers um, use a, a standing objection to say, "Well, judge, you know, for the reasons our motion eliminate, um, we would like to make a standing objection relating to those to this particular issue." Does that work, or in your opinion, you know, as appellate counsel, do you like the trial trial counsel to make objections to each of those questions? I think the standing objection usually works. I, I, what I would do is, in the particular jurisdiction do a little bit of research and see if standing objections are generally considered sufficient to preserve an, a, an issue. I think in most jurisdictions they are. I'm not sure they are in all. So I think you want to do a little bit of research and make sure you're comfortable uh, that that's the case. But but certainly if it is, then that's a less um, intrusive way of making the objections and preserving the issue. Got it. And you also mentioned, you know, using appellate lawyers during the trial to consult. And we had a case where where we did that, um, a former Illinois appellate court justice. We had him as serving on our trial team. And it was ex- it was extremely effective because having a former appellate court justice sit in during the trial court, to me, I think really inform the judge, the trial judge, as to how seriously we were taking this. And, you know, she understood. And it was actually funny because the justice had written um, a book on evidence and we had some evidentiary issues that that came up. So I think what what you mentioned in, in having appellate appellate counsel sit on your trial team seems to be a very effective way, but obviously there are, you know, cost considerations and and things like that. But if it's, if it's a a major trial or, or an issue where you want, certainly want the judge to understand that you're taking it seriously, that seems to be the way to go. If your client um, agrees. I I agree. I think that is very helpful. And if you can get somebody who, you know, is a former judge in that jurisdiction, that, that certainly helps as well. But but in any event, I think having a, an appellate lawyer or or appellate lawyers on the trial team can be very beneficial. And, and I think in a major matter, most clients understand that benefit and and are are okay with the expense of doing it. In, in a smaller matter, it may be more difficult, and there's always a cost benefit analysis. But but I think where you can do it, it is very helpful, uh, and it really does help preserve the record and make the arguments most effectively. And and what I've seen is that sometimes when you have the appellate lawyers as part of the trial team, sometimes the motions you're making may be a little more persuasive and and sometimes work and you you actually win your motion in the trial court and potentially win the case on motions in the trial court. And that certainly helps when you're when you're appealing or the other side's appealing and you've already won below that that's a great position to be in. So let's switch let's switch the script and talk a little bit about how you prepare for an oral argument and I'm particularly interested in thinking about how young lawyers can be involved in assisting um, the partners that they're working with um, to get ready for an appeal and like how they can help them during the appeal. I've heard I've heard tell, you know, partners say, you know, don't ever don't ever stop me during an argument. Don't ever, you know, give me a, a slip of paper during the argument because you're going to, you know, throw my concentration and that sort of thing. So let, let's talk about the preparation side and then we'll talk about kind of the, the day of the argument side. So how do you use kind of other members of your appellate team, associates and, and paralegals and that sort of thing to actually prepare and get ready for an oral argument? So at the very beginning, I have you know, a paralegal prepare several binders. I, I like to have a binder that's got the briefs in it. I like to have a separate binder for all of the cases or at least all of the important cases. And I like to have a, a third binder that's got the, the record, typically just a joint appendix or whatever else you have for the record. And, and then as I prepare for the argument, I often have the associates on the case, number one, prepare uh, questions that they think are likely to come up. Sometimes I have them prepare proposed answers. Sometimes I I fill in those myself. 
uh, but it's usually a, a collaborative effort where we work on the answers together. I also will will have somebody on the team uh, usually prepare a, sort of a cheat sheet of the key record sites that I've got to know. And then I use all of those materials in our moot courts. And I always have the associates or other people on the team participate in the moot courts. Usually they'll ask questions in at least one of them and be present in, in all of them to, to take notes and to consider issues that we might want to follow up with further research or further analysis before the argument. On the day of the argument itself, typically I have one person sit at a council table with me. It's rare that you're able to have more than one person. Sometimes you can, but usually I have one person sit at council table with me. And if there is something that comes up that's unexpected, which happens a lot, I can rely on that person to hand me whatever is necessary or to to write a note of whatever is necessary. I, I had an argument a number of years ago in the Seventh Circuit, and a dispute arose as to whether there had been a full meet and confer process on a particular motion. And my opponent had represented to the court that we had refused to meet and confer. And my colleague who was sitting at council table was able to very quickly pull out uh, the four different letters where we had asked the other side to meet and confer. And I was able in rebuttal to go through those letters pretty quickly and show that in fact we had met and conferred and the panel started chuckling <laughs> when I did that and we knew we were in pretty good shape. Uh, so that was very helpful. I've had instances where, you know, the court asks a question about a particular page of a particular case and I don't have that page in front of me and my assistant at, at argument will, will hand me the page. I had an argument fairly recently where the court asked about a provision of a statute that was very tangentially related to the case, and I didn't have that statute in front of me. Uh, that was a video argument, and the, the associate on the case was able to very quickly email me the page of that statute, and so I had it in front of me in about 20 seconds. So it is very helpful to have somebody who can assist in those in those ways, and I've also had colleagues write notes that can be very helpful as well. So it sounds like not only do you have to know the facts and the record and the law, but it's extremely helpful to have someone with you, an associate, a young lawyer, uh, perhaps, who is also just as knowledgeable and up to speed on the case, may, maybe even more so, uh, to assist uh, during arguments uh, to make sure that you have uh, what you need. We always hear you know, long, young lawyers ask, you know, what, what can I do to advance my career? What can I do to get that, uh, become a lead counsel? One of those things, in my opinion, and, and um, you know, I'd love for, to get your opinion, is to make sure that you're reliable on the case that, that, that you're on. Don't just be kind of like a potted plant, but actually, you know, do the, do the grunt work to, to, to know the, know the record, know the law, uh, to make those suggestions, to make those, um, you know, quick binder searches for, you know, the letters that you're looking for and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the concept one of my colleagues uses is the term ownership. And I think that's a really great, great way to look at it. If you're on a matter, you need to take ownership of it. it even if you're not the lead counsel, if you take ownership, and you do everything that's necessary to make sure that you're fully prepared to do whatever it is you can do, that will really help with the case. And certainly at oral argument, people who take ownership uh, really, really assist the person who's arguing the case. And there, you know, there have been matters in my career, you know, even, you know, more recently where I haven't been arguing a case, but I've been assisting one of my partners in, for example, Supreme Court matters or other matters. And by really knowing the record and knowing the arguments inside and out, I was able to provide more assistance than if I if I really hadn't done that. So I think that's a great lesson uh, and something that for junior lawyers, that's a great approach they can take. So Larry, we're coming to the end of our time together and I had one last question. Can you talk about how a litigator can become admitted to the US Supreme Court? Right, so if I'm remembering correctly, and it's been a long time since I did this, but I think if you've been in practice for three years or more, you can apply for admission to the Supreme Court bar. And in the old days, you, were, you had two ways of doing it. One was to just do it on the papers where you would fill out the, the application and you had to get 
And I, I have to say, I don't remember it. It was at least one sponsor. It may have been two sponsors who had to sponsor you for admission to the court. And then you could, as I said, do it on the papers. Or in the old days, you could go down to the court and be sworn in in person, which was a wonderful experience. And for those of us in Washington, it was something we really tried to do, where you would go down and there would be a number of people being admitted during a particular argument day. And this would happen right at the beginning of the court session, is the Chief Justice would lead the short ceremony during which you would be admitted. You would you would say the oath. Uh, you'd be welcomed uh, by the Chief Justice to the court. And then typically you would sit down and watch the arguments for that session. Now, since the pandemic, I, I don't think that they're doing those live right now. And so that's a shame. Maybe they'll start doing them again this coming term. But it really was a wonderful experience to, to go down in person and to be sworn in. And, and that when you, you were sworn in live, the person sponsoring you would actually come up to the podium and move your admission. Uh, and that can be a wonderful experience. I've had the privilege of moving the admission of several of my colleagues to the Supreme Court bar, and it's really a, a thrill to be able to do that and certainly a thrill for them to be able to um, get sworn in live. And I, I, hope, I hope that that process returns as soon as possible. Yeah, that sounds like a terrific memory um, for you, getting sworn in as well as uh, helping others of your colleagues to get sworn in. Um, sounds like a great experience uh, before the court. So, uh, Larry Rosenberg, thank you so much uh, for being on the show today. Really appreciate all of your tips and taking us behind the scenes of the Supreme Court. Thank you so much, Dave. Really appreciate it. Now it's time for a quick tip from the ABA litigation section. I want to welcome back Latasha Ellis to the show. Latasha is a litigator in the Washington, D.C. office of Hunt and Andrews Kurth, focusing on insurance coverage cases. Welcome back to the show, Latasha. Hi, Dave. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm great. Thank you. Great. Well, I understand you're going to talk about witness preparation today. So what's your quick tip? Sure. So witness preparation is one of the most challenging tasks for an attorney, but effective preparation and whether that's for a deposition or a trial is so worth the time spent with the prospective witness. So I have five tips, um, quick tips for effective witness prep. The first tip is be prepared. You know, um, first and foremost, attorneys in addition to setting up a time for the witness prep, attorneys have to set a, aside a sufficient amount of time to actually prepare for that witness prep meeting. And that means reviewing substantive issues involves creating an outline, organizing case documents that they're going to review with the witness, just really just being prepared for that meeting. The second tip is helping the witness focus. So in scheduling the prep meeting with the witness, it's important to do so at a time that actually allows the witness to focus. Um, you don't want the witness to be diverted by phone calls or emails, business demands, or other outside distractions um, or people that are asking for the witness's time. So it's important to keep that in mind when scheduling the witness prep session. The third tip is be thorough. I mean, it would it would be great if you could have more than one meeting with the witness so that, you know, you would have multiple opportunities to prepare the witness, but that generally doesn't happen. Um, so just being prepared and being thorough will help you maximize the time that you have with the witness. So that includes, you know, explaining the nature of the testimonial or deposition process to clear up any misunderstandings or confusion that the witness may have from their hours of watching trials on TV or depositions on TV. But, you know, it's really important to um, not only share with the witness what that process will look like, but also to make sure that they understand the importance of providing truthful, clear testimony and in this being thorough phase, I have found that it's really helpful if you explain the purpose. Um, you know, for example, the discovery deposition is intended to preserve testimony, um, just explaining how that process works in any applicable rules about the setting and the context and, you know, how the deposition or the trial may work. 
I think that that helps the witness um, become more comfortable with how the day will go. And so that's a, a huge part of being thorough with the prep. The fourth step is be inquis- inquisitive. Um, you know, part of the reason that we're prepping the witness is really to hear from, you know, the witness, their account of the facts and events um, as they recall it, but also to be able to observe the body language and word choice that the witness is using. So certainly not suggesting that you should ever coach a witness to recall events um, because certainly their credibility um, will also be evaluated, but it can be helpful to remind the witness that their words do matter um, and to choose, you know, words um, that would be helpful. For example, if we are deposing a witness about an auto um, accident, we may want to refrain from using the word accident if it may have been our witnesses, um, if our witness is in question of being in fault, and instead of accident, use collision. You know, so word choice can matter. But it also um, could, again, help put the witness at ease if you are inquisitive and observing some of those things and can provide them some good feedback. And that is a great segue into my fifth and final tip, which is be in constructive and be constructive. So, you know, for any type of testimony, it's always important for the attorney to give the witness clear guidance on how to answer questions. That means, you know, advising the witness not to start answering the question until the question has been completely asked, pausing before answering the question, just to make sure that they understand the question. Um, Of course, not volunteering information. So, Things like that, those sorts of instructions and providing constructive feedback about how the witness prep session is going or has went, that can also help with your overall witness prep. So, you know, it's important to devote a considerable amount of time to preparing a witness for, in some cases, an experience that your witness probably has never had. And, it's, you know, it may cause some anxiety. So any time spent with a witness and preparing them is certainly time well spent and you want to maximize it. So again, just to reiterate those quick tips, it is uh, be prepared, help your witness focus, be thorough, be inquisitive, and be instructive and constructive. Great tips, Latasha. And of course, if our listeners want to learn more about witness preparation, I encourage folks to go back to my interview with Ken Berman on episode 10 of the show entitled Reinventing Witness Preparation. Uh, But thank you, uh, Latasha, for those tips and helping us to uh, remember uh, the important things. And of course, you know, being a witness, it's kind of a fish out of water experience because uh, hopefully uh, not many people you know have to be a witness and certainly people don't want to be a witness and so it's uh, thank you for uh, bringing those tips to our attention sure no problem that's all we have for our show today and i'd love to hear your thoughts about today's episode if you have comments or a question you'd like for me to answer on an upcoming show you can email me at dscrivenyoung without the hyphen at gmail.com and connect with me on social i'm at attorney dsy on linkedin instagram twitter and facebook you can also connect with the aba litigation section on those platforms as well but as much as i'd like to connect with you online nothing beats meeting in person at our next litigation section event so please make plans to join us at the 2022 Professional Success Summit in Los Angeles, October 26th through the 28th. This is a great conference and CLE event dedicated to maximizing the potential of litigators from racial and ethnic backgrounds that have traditionally been unrepresented in the legal profession. To find out more and for registration information, go to ambar.org slash PSS. If you like the show, please help spread the word by sharing a link to this episode with a friend or through a post on social and invite others to join the show and community. If you want to leave a review over at Apple Podcasts, it's incredibly helpful. Even a quick rating over at Spotify Podcasts is super helpful as well. And finally, I want to quickly thank some folks who make the show possible. Thanks, of course, to Michelle Oberts, who's on staff with the litigation section for her help, as well as our fabulous producer, Rich Rivera. Thank you, Rich, for all of your hard work and everything that you do. Thanks also goes out to the co-chairs of the litigation section's audio content committee, Josh Jones and Tyler True. Thank you to Lawrence Coletti and the audio professionals from Legal Talk Network. And last but not least, thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time.